We're going to do it as an, as an example. We're going to do the cherry first stage. And here the stage is basically instead of the stage is active feedback. We have active devices in the feedback group. And you have a, basically a resistive divider here with two resistors. And then your feedback path consists of some a follower. This was R3. Which one was R? This is R1, right? The output is taken from here, and the input is a current in this case, which can be a drain of another transistor or something. This stage is sometimes used as uh, an active lo a load that you can basically make into an underdamped or overdamped response. So, uh, and then we, the way we analyzed, the one we looked at had also, we said, okay, let's see that we have some capacitors, two capacitors here. So we said, let's have capacitor at the output, which we call, I believe, C2, right? Yep. And this one was C1, one of these. So we said, well, let's find out what the transfer function and everything looks like, right? So the first thing we determined is the asymptotic transfer function, right? H infinity. What does they have to determine H infinity? We have to choose a source. And then basically say that's our reference source. We have to be clear what it is. So in this case, we'll say, okay, well, let's assume, well, let's look at this and let's look at the pi model for this guy. This is basically what you ideally would like to see this do. 
A0 is going to be 0. In, in, pract in, pract in, in general, in the most general case, you also have this capacitor here. And what it does is that basically there's some leakage, there would be some leakage through here, and that would be your H2, your direct transfer, which has nothing to do with feedback. It's basically just parasitic paths through the circuit <coughs> from the input to the output. So in this case, H0 is 0, no problem. Then the only thing that is left is T, which is going to be a function of frequency, because that's the only thing left, has to capture some of the frequency. So the question is, what is the return ratio? The return ratio is calculated, what do we do? Basically, we apply a test current source here, in parallel with that GM, basically here. Uh, IZ, which doesn't matter really, this is IX, and this is IY. And we talked about this when we did that. We said, well, the one, what we're really doing is that we're replacing this with an ideal current source, right? With, a, with an independent current source. That was the actual procedure. The actual procedure is to take this out, put an independent current source of I Y, I I X, I'm sorry, I X, and estimate what would this current source do when it was coming back. And one way of doing that, or drawing that one way of without making a lot of mess on the circuit is this. So basically, this whole thing is equivalent to an independent current source I X. That's the way you should be thinking about it. So if it's an independent current source now, there is no feedback. So this impedance is not really affected by anything in that sense. Or that so, so let's cap the quantity. So Ix, Ix is applied here. So there's a current divider here between this guy and that guy. One way to think about it is that you can look at the low frequency thing and the high frequency element. So there are two ways to do this. You can do time constant or you can do a low frequency high frequency. So let's do the low frequency part first and then do the time constant. So we can say Okay, it consists of T of zero, the low frequency component, which basically let's count times some things. So how many poles and how many zeros? So, so look at the circuit, think about the circuit. What is the circuit you're thinking about? It's an independent current source driving this node, going around and coming back, and we want to see what's the output. The output is this IY. So the input is this independent IX, and the output is IY. So we have to calculate the time constant. We have two independent capacitors, two capacitors. We have two time constants that are uncoupled. They're not coupled to each other because shorting or opening of this one doesn't affect this one or vice versa. We have no zeros because if you short either one of them or both, there's not going to be any change. There's not going to be a non-zero transfer function. So T1, T2, and T12 are zero. So we know we have two independent poles in this case, which, whose frequencies would be one of the time constants. That's be minus one of the time constants. Uh, so what are the time constants? What is the time constant for this guy? For this capacitor? So we can call this one, well, so there's tau 1 and tau 2. Tau 1 is the time constant of this thing. What is the resistance it sees? And this is not there for the current ratio calculation. What, what resistance does it see? It sees R3 plus R1, right? So it sees it's C1 times R3 plus Rn1, or Rn2, I'm sorry, Rn of that guy. And looking in here, you don't see anything. There's nothing, it's just like infinity. And then, and this is exact, what I'm writing, there's no approximation. And C2, what's the time, what's the resistance seen by C2? R1 plus R2. So I have two time constants, so I know I can write it as tau 1 as 1 plus tau 2 s, and the reason I can factor it like this is that we determined them to be uncoupled. So we know that these are independent. How did you determine them to be uncoupled? If I short or open this, the resistance seen by this guy doesn't change. And vice versa, if I short or open this, the resistance seen by this guy doesn't change. So they are uncoupled. So that's what it is. And T naught, we can calculate T, T, T of zero, we can calculate it, right? So it's basically low frequency calculation in this case. If this is Ix, this voltage becomes R1 Ix minus R1 Ix. So there's an R1 there. And then you have a follower here. But the impedance here in the follower is infinity, right? At low frequencies. You have an infinity voltage here. So basically all the voltage, so you have a voltage division between Rm2 of this guy, R3, and infinity. What is this voltage? It's the same as that one. 
So this voltage is the same, so you get what multiplied by GM of this guy. And that's your return ratio. You get this curve. I mean, there's a minus sign which goes back to the definition of the return ratio, which has a minus sign. Okay, so that's that's it. So and this is correct. So there was a question last time about oh, wouldn't the feedback affect this impedance? And the answer is no, because there is no feedback when you're doing this, because you're driving this with an independent current source. So effectively, practically, you're broken. You're broken the loop in this way. But so this is basically what you what you get out of that. Now, the interesting thing about this is that we looked at it and said, well, okay, this is the T, but what really the transfer function looks like, the closed loop transfer function of this thing, of course, now that H0 is 0, H is going to be H infinity, T of S over 1 plus T of S. Right? So what we can do, we can write this as H infinity, this is going to be T0 over 1 plus tau 1 S, 1 plus tau 2 s over 1 plus t of 0 plus 2 parentheses and you can clean it up and basically you can write it at h infinity t of 0 over 1 plus t of 0 times 1 over 1 plus tau 1 plus tau 2 over 1 plus t of 0 s plus tau 1, tau 2, over 1 plus t of 0 s squared. And t is the basically low frequency return ratio. So this is the low frequency part of the transfer function. Right? This is basically h of 0. Which again makes sense. It's h infinity of low frequency scaled by the return ratio over 1 plus return ratio. And if the return ratio low frequency is high, this is going to be close to h infinity. So this is what you can see at low frequencies. At high frequencies, you see two poles. So your frequency response is going to, you basically your, uh, your magnitude is going to drop, and you're going to have some phase. Fine. And where are these poles? So let's look at these poles as a function of the return ratio. So if return ratio is zero, if t of zero is zero. Where are these poles? Just as if minus one on top of one. Right, at, at, at the original places, right? It's as if you don't have any feedback. So originally, your two poles are going to be here. Let's say minus one over tau one, minus one over tau two. And this is the sigma j omega. This is the complex. Right. Now, as you increase t of zero, what happens? As you increase the return, as your return ratio is increased, what will happen to these poles? Well, there are different ways to see this, but so you basically you have to solve the quadratic equation here, right? You can solve the quadratic equation and see where it is. Just basically, let's do it quickly. Um, and we, some of, I mean, if, you know, if you're familiar with root locus, you know where they are going to go. But we'll talk about root locus later. But if you're not, let's just quickly do it. So the roots of the quadratic equation, basically P1 and P2, are going to be minus this guy. I'm just going to show that T. But I'm going to drop that for making my life easier. Plus minus square root of this guy squared, tau 1 plus tau 2 over 1 plus T squared, minus 4, 1, and then tau 1, tau 2 over 1 plus t. <coughs> Correct? Divided by whatever that tau 1, tau 2. So what can you say about the real part? So look at it carefully. This is the real part, right? This is the real part of the what is it? It's tau 1 plus tau 2 over tau 1 plus tau 1 tau 2 factor of 2 here. So it's independent of t. Right? Is that correct? 
P1 and P2 are real. What can you say about P1 plus P2? P1 plus P2, this term disappears, right? Because one is more plus, one is plus, plus, one is minus. And this 2 disappears. So P1 plus P2 is simply a tau 1, a minus tau 1 plus tau 2 over tau 1, tau 1, tau 2. Right? This is where P1 plus P2 is. So it says that the sum of the real part, the real parts, the sum will remain constant, is independent of T. That means that if this pole moves this way by this much, this other pole has to move this way by the same amount. So their average, so their mean, remains the same. Their sum has to remain the same, right? So that tells you something. And as, let, let's look at what happens as we increase t. As t increases, this term becomes what? Small, uh, small. Becomes smaller. So the difference between these two becomes smaller. So that means that the pole as we increase the t start moving this way and that way. So the poles. As the return ratio is increased, they get closer and closer to each other. So this is increasing t, or t0. And they get closer and closer and closer. And where do they meet? At some point they meet, right? Where do they meet? Divided by 2, right? They meet at this point. They have to. Their sum has to be this. And if they are equal, each one of them has to be half left. So they meet exactly half way. So, and this is the point where Q is what? Because beyond this point, this is the point of Q equals exactly equal to one half. So this is the point where Q is one half. Right? It means that you have a pair of <coughs> poles right on top. In, in other words, that's basically where this becomes zero, this term. And when that, we calculated that, right? I mean, when this becomes zero, it, it's another way of saying. Um, so basically, tau one squared, tau one tau two, or one plus t equals to four tau one tau two. Square, so this cancels this square. We get this d squared. This cancels that. Um, these guys cancel. No, sorry. This is it plus? So it's a tau one square plus tau two square plus two tau one tau two square. This cancels that, and then you basically can get the expression that we had last time, which was basically when tau one tau two over tau 1, tau, tau 1 minus tau 2 over tau 1 tau 2 is greater than one half. Is that what half? Yeah. Uh, tau is squared, but the numerator is squared. Okay. Is it squared? The numerator is squared and there's a 4 in the denominator. Okay. Greater than? Uh, yeah. T1. T0. T0. Zero. T zero, yeah. So this is a condition, right? And, and, equal, and for this point exactly, we have the equal. So what happens beyond this point? Beyond this point, if you keep increasing t, this term becomes greater than this term, and then what happens? You get complex on your okay. So now, this term becomes imaginary. So the real part now of both of them is the same. If that's imaginary, this is the only part that gives you real. So it means that the real part remains at this point. So the poles will move on this line. But the real part has to be made constant. And they have to be in complex conjugate pairs, right? So that tells you that they will move in this direction as they become complex and as we increase t, the return ratio. So initially, this is not a problem. But once they get farther and farther away, since this part, this is the real part remains constant, the imaginary part is growing, this angle becomes smaller and smaller. In other words, the q is going higher and higher. Your system becomes more and more underdamped, which means that the response <coughs> starting from this became, comes the frequency response becomes more and more like that. This being the Q. Approximately. Right? Or in time domain, your step response started off from something that was like this, became like that, became like that, became like that, 
because more and more under that rating. But at least in terms of this analysis, it can never become unstable in the sense that it can never have right half plane poles. The poles remain great, the left half plane, they become very, very under that, but they can. But now let's, let's introduce another element to this. Let's say you have a third pole. So how can we have a third pole? For instance, if we were to take into account this capacitance, C3. Right? There's something in switch. Now, these guys are not uncoupled. So if you really do that, it becomes a second order polynomial here. But bottom line is that you will have three poles to start with. So if you have three poles to start with, and then when we talk about the locus, we'll see exactly how to predict something like this. So you start off with three poles. Let's say you start with three, three of poles. And what do you think will happen as you increase T? If these guys are close to each other, let's just for sake of argument, the effect of this pole is going to be not very large on their behavior. So they will start still qualitatively behave the same way, right? They will move towards each other. So these guys will move this way towards each other. Just move this way, this way. But they won't meet halfway, exactly halfway anymore. They will meet somewhere else. And this guy will end up going that way. Going getting farther and farther away. Now you can actually there's a method, Luke Lopez method, which basically tells you exactly how to come up with this, and we'll discuss this later. But they will meet somewhere, and then when they've just met, as soon as they are departing and becoming complex, what do you expect them to do? Which way do they expect them to go? What angle do you expect them to go? Do they expect them to go like this, or go straight? Because when they're very, very close to each other, this guy is so far away that its effect doesn't matter. As far as these guys are concerned, they're right next to each other, two poles. So it, as far as these guys are concerned, this is very similar to that situation, initially. So initially, they go off at the right angle. But then, what happens is that, and you will see in the room, is basically the poles start repelling each other. So there's a repelling force from here. And what does that do? It basically starts pushing them this way. And with three poles, what you see that you can actually create a situation where you can go to the right half way. Have a pair of compass running T on the right edge. So again, we'll talk about this when we talk about stability in more details. But this is also an in introduction to what interesting things that can happen with feedback. You have feedback. 